across the Brazos and Waco Ride hard and I'll make it by dawn Across the Brazos and Waco all right, well, Stephen, it's a bit of a sad day today. I hate to do this to people. We've been on on the air, as it were, for how many years now? Like two and a half, uh, three over years? Two, two and a half years, and that's uh, 10 years in COVID years. <laughs> but I am actually leaving Waco. I know that's a, that's a big thing. I am so angry <laughs> at you, Randy. I know it's a good opportunity for you uh, where you're heading, but yeah, it's a, it's a big loss for uh, all of us, for Waco in general, I think, particularly at the podcast. This is this is Randy's brainchild uh, way back in the summer of 2018. Yeah, so to give some people some context, I'm not originally from Waco. So I love Waco, but I'm originally from Tulsa. And we moved here about six years ago for my wife's job, which she doesn't have anymore. I changed jobs a few times. I've changed jobs a few times, but really came to love Waco and really was interested about learning about the history. So that's why I initially said, there's got to be a Waco podcast out here somewhere. And I couldn't find one. So, you know, if you really want something and it doesn't exist, I'm a firm believer that you should, maybe that's your call to create it. So that's when I reached out to you to kind of put together this Waco history podcast, specifically starting so I could learn more about my great grandfather. But I've just learned so much more about Waco than I ever thought I would. Well, I, I think you're a representative of kind of a wave of Wacoans that have come in over the past decade and, and now call Waco home. I, I know there's some things you want to talk about, but why were you so interested? I, I'll ask you that question. Why were you so interested in kind of learning more about the history of this place? Well, I'm a firm believer that wherever you are, wherever you live, you should really love where you are. And I think that starts with really knowing and understanding where you are. Every city I've lived in has a specific culture. And I feel like you can get closer to the people and closer to just living in the community if you understand the history. And so I've really done that anywhere I've lived. There's some really good publications in Tulsa. There's one called This Land, which really digs into like Tulsa's history. And I was always enthralled with that. When I lived in Tokyo, I was all about going to like the historical monuments and the temples and stuff. So that's just kind of how I've always been. I'm very inquisitive. And I feel like history has been covered in a lot of the bigger cities, but for a city the size of Waco, there wasn't really a podcast that was covering it. So that's really the whole impetus there. I think of the variety of folks that we've had with us. Oh man, what a motley crew. I started to give you a quiz today. I was going <laughs> to draft a quiz and see see what Randy learned. I, I decided to not do that. <laughs> but I was always interested in the sort of things that you wanted to know about when we had folks in. I'm all about the story. I really love a good story. I won't let the facts get in the way of a good story sometimes. <laughs> Probably much to your chagrin as an actual professor <laughs> of history. So I think the the fun uh, haunted episodes we've done, we've done quite a few of those or, or the ones about local lore and legends where something can't be proved one way or the other. I posted on our Facebook page about the two tombs of Telemachus. I forget his full name. He's got like five mm -hmm. names, right? Yeah, Mr. Johnson. So stuff like that is really interesting to me. Like, you know, he's a historical figure. He has a tie to Waco. He has, there's a lot to know about him, but he also has some lore around him. So I think that's mm -hmm. what's, most interesting to me is tying together the lore, but also, you know, the actual facts of something. Yeah. You also always wanted a spicy story. <laughs> Spicier, the better. <laughs> <laughs> if you've been in Waco any time, if you're driving around, you, you hear Randy's voice because of all the voiceover work he's done at different venues and uh, on radio and in uh, around town. And so I, I hear Randy all the time. So he'll be with <laughs> us, I'm sure. We'll see how long they keep that stuff around. <laughs> but a couple things that, that you may not know about Randy. And one thing I wanted to ask related to this question of getting to know a place is some of my favorite images of Waco are the old bird's eye mm -hmm. images. These 19th century kind of looks or Imagine looks at Waco from above that, that an artist drew. And then I think of connecting that to your uh, drone piloting yeah. uh, over Waco. And I, I'd like to ask about, you know, getting to know a place from an angle that we don't normally get that vantage point from and just kind of maybe how that kind of helps you uh, kind of learn the landscape and get to know Waco. Anytime I go to a new part of town or a part I've been on many times, like get the drone up real high and kind of look around and see what I can see. It's been really fun, you know, flying really close to the Alico building. A lot of people have done that. 
But I like also, you know, the shots of all the different bridges that are crossing the Brazos, the history that we've talked about, and really connecting with it more, knowing that those piers that are sticking out of the water used to be the inner urban railroad. Like I wouldn't have known that if I hadn't have done some history there. And then flying over the top of Cameron Park is really cool. I have a shot directly above Lover's Leap from about 200 feet above it. And you can really see this cool spiral pattern to the ground there that they put down. So stuff like that's interesting. And then of course, one of my favorite pastimes is kayaking. So I like to see the way the river interacts with the landscape and how it flows through Waco and surrounding communities. So that's always a big love of mine as well. And then just, you know, here locally, I live over by Mountain View Park and it's it's a nice park and it's a pretty park. But if you get up just about 100 feet, you notice how close you are to the lake right there. And so there's some really pretty images, mm -hmm. you know, even in your own backyard. So I really encourage people if they want to try their hand at drone photography, it's not that hard. The drones are much better than they've ever been. And you can really see a really cool perspective on a city that you haven't seen before. One thing I was trying to do, and I never got around to doing very many, but I wanted to do cool drone shots of all of the famous courthouses around the area. So Texas has so many amazing courthouses. And so I got probably five or six different courthouses that I've shot video of. And it's just each one is similar, but very, very unique as well. I wanted to get you to, to draw me a, a kayaking, secret kayaking spots. Because <laughs> I, I know you have some spots that, and you did this before, but coronavirus is really the thing that got you out really exploring kayaking, right? Yeah. So my kids love to swim in the summer. They don't want to be anywhere that's not too far from the water. And our go-to previously was going to the Y, but obviously with coronavirus that's not really an option. So we explored some of the rivers nearby, especially the Bosque, and saw people out there kayaking and thought, man, that would be really fun. So we actually picked those up earlier in the season, like early March, and we spent all summer going down a lot of different rivers out of town to go down the Colorado, the San Marcos. Around here locally, that's very interesting. What people don't know about is where the middle Bosque connects to the lake. So it's this little spot kind of between Crawford and here. And there are many different places you can actually access it. But there's kind of like my secret spot. You can see it on Google Maps, but there's actually like a place with a parking lot near the Hog Creek Park area. Hog Creek Maintenance Park area. I'm not really sure what to call that. You know, I would really encourage people to go out and explore the natural beauty that is Waco and the surrounding areas. And especially the rivers. I mean, in the spring, the Bosque River is going to be so pretty. It gets a little dry from time to time, but really just get out there and explore these really great rivers that we have. I mean, we take that for granted. I mean, the Brazos, you can go kayaking on the Brazos any day of the year, basically. It's really nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's beautiful. I've seen some of the shots you've taken out to, out on the water, and they're, and they're great. I didn't tell people what I'm actually going to do, so I should probably say that as well. I'm going to northwest Arkansas. We don't know exactly where we're going to live, but kind of in the Fayetteville area. I'm going to be working for J.B. Hunt, and I'm going to join them on their web team. So this was kind of a conscious decision on our part to be closer to family. I'm sure during COVID, everyone's kind of felt that they want to be closer to the people they love. And for us, being six and a half hours away has been a lot of driving, just a lot of sadness when I think about my cute nephew who lives in Tulsa kind of growing up without his cousins. So getting closer to home, it was really the main reason why we chose to do this. One of the side benefits is that uh, they have some really great rivers outdoors there in Northwest Arkansas. So I hope to be back in Waco at some point, like visiting and stuff like that, because it really has a piece of my heart. You know, there's family history here. I've got more relatives in the Dallas, San Antonio Austin areas. So I have family to come see around here. So I don't think it's the last that Waco will see of me. Well, I don't have the authority to do this, but I'd like to give you a key to the city. <laughs> Can I get one of those big ones like the Liberty Mutual commercial? Yeah. Uh, that's right. right on the key ring. <laughs> Hang around your neck. Yeah. And there's also, I mean, having your kids grow up where they get to know your parents is awesome. That's one of the reasons I moved back to Texas and, and it, uh, it proved to be great. So what you mentioned, there was some stuff that you wanted to share. What were some things you wanted to share? Well, I had some questions for you. Oh, <laughs> you have questions for me. This is about you. Yeah. It's not about me. One thing that I want our, our listeners to know is that this is not the end of the Waco History Podcast. It's going to continue. We're going to partner, or not we're, you are going to partner with Rogue Media Network to kind of keep this going. And the exact shape it's going to take is going to be a, you know slightly different, but a lot of what viewers are used to. 
So I want to know up until this point, what has been your favorite episode? That's a really good question. And I, I don't know that I've reflected on it to think about it. So I think for me, the favorite stories were the ones that I knew less about. You know, mm -hmm. I, I think a lot of our audience is is maybe coming to local history for the first time. I think of like the episode we did on uh, R.D. Evans, who uh, was the African-American lawyer here in town, led the case to overturn the white primary in Texas, the first mm -hmm. case to overthrow the white primary. And I think the reason why I like that so much is we tend to associate significant history with faraway places. Even American history happened in, in Philadelphia, or if you're a Texan, it happened in San Antonio or places far from here. And it happened by, it's caused by people that never stepped foot here. You know, it was African-American history is about uh, Martin Luther King Jr. And, and others, but I love it when we have the opportunity to learn more and highlight uh, the way history encountered the history of Waco, you know, history with a big H uh, encountered uh, local history here. And so I really liked uh, that episode just because I felt like it was, that was a story that, that really needed to know more. And of course, what we did to introduce Tom Wilson and what uh, mm -hmm. Keep Wake Up Loud was able to do to really fully explore that story. That was a great episode to get the chance to do. I enjoyed the ones we got to do, just the two of us, with the uh, coronavirus. Uh, the, the couple of episodes uh, we did last summer with just the two of us in the room was a lot of fun. Uh, mm -hmm. I, wish we had, I wish we had done more of that. Yeah. Yeah. I had a lot of good times whenever I got to learn about a piece of Waco's history that people I knew who are longtime Wacoans had no clue about. That to me was fun. It's like, you've been here all this time. You should have known about that. Yeah, and it's interesting how long timers will engage with stuff sometimes. We'll post things on social media and you'll get a comment from someone who's been here a long time. I've never heard of that. And then yeah. kind of move on. So, <laughs> you know, it not disagreeing that it, that it was true or not true, but just stating that that they'd never heard of that. And so I I think some of the uh, the same stories get repeated uh, and and retold, but sometimes if we just stop uh, and look around us, we can really find out uh, some amazing things. And there's there's so much. I'm glad uh, Rogue Media has agreed to continue to partner with the project because there, yeah, there's so many great stories that we haven't gotten to yet. What's one story that you really wanted to get to with me that we haven't gotten to? I really wanted to do, you know, we, we talked about this being a, a warts and all sort of podcast. We haven't really gotten into the difficult, a lot of the really difficult aspects of Waco's uh, history that that has kind of a, a living memory association with Waco. I don't think I have to name things. You know, we didn't get into the Waco siege that happened at the Branch Davidian compound. We didn't get into some of the more infamous lynchings that have occurred in town. We, we set out to do this. We really wanted to cover some of the harder parts of Waco's past. I really feel like the the difficult things need to be talked about because they're difficult things. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so I was hoping to do uh, some of that with you on this uh, roller coaster ride. Yeah, we, we didn't get to some of those low points that I thought we would get to. I mean, we did cover a few things that were a little bit tougher, like talking about the tornado and stuff. There's a lot of death and carnage there. And the crash at Crush was kind of like a downer, but at the same time, kind of just a silly event to begin with. So there's been, you know, episodes all over the map for us. I really enjoyed the live events we did. Uh, was that fun. was a lot of fun. Uh, the Dr. Pepper Museum asked me last week for us to come back and do another live event. I had to break the news to them, and so so they're bummed you're leaving town as well. But that was a fun event, a fun event with uh, Balcones, and so I think there's there's a lot of room to do more of those uh, getting out in the community. And uh, Brother Well, of course, our uh, longtime uh, sponsor, having us out for Waco Trivia Night, and so there, I, I really enjoyed some of those opportunities to get out in the community. I've actually heard live podcast recordings through Rogue Media at Brotherwell. So I know that's going to be a hot venue once all this COVID business subsides. Awesome. I'll look forward to doing that. And maybe we can stage you being back in town. And Yeah, that'd be fun. Yeah, yeah, that'd be a lot of fun. So one thing I thought was interesting, something I've never asked you specifically, but you know, you've come at this world from the academic side and you've been doing the oral history for a long time as well. How do you think podcasting has kind of changed the way 
academia and oral history kind of looks at promoting itself. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. You know, one of the themes we talk about in uh, oral history, and there's different ways to look at kind of recording your own narrative or having someone record your narrative. One way we talk about it is giving voice and, you know, the opportunity to maybe uh, democratize the historical record, you know, bring more voices in that may, maybe didn't have a place or were underrepresented. The historical record is by no means neutral. Mm-hmm. You know, some groups are overrepresented in the historical record. Other groups are underrepresented or absent. Podcasting, I think, is a movement, which I really do think of it as a movement, is, I think, a level of it is about just giving voices and a platform to people and democratizing the broadcasting landscape to uh, allow people to have a seat at the table. And so I, I see some comparatives there that I think are are really connected in kind of the motivations in doing it. And before I even met you, I was messing around on the wacohistory.org app, and I was always intrigued by whenever there was an audio piece of audio attached to that history article. And I thought, man, there's got to be a way to get this out to more people. And we've only done it a, you know, a couple times accessing that huge archive you guys have, but I think it really adds a lot of color and texture because a lot of times podcasts can just be a couple of people talking, but I loved, mm-hmm. especially like on the World War One episode where we kind of weaved in some historical narrative from people who were actually there, who are no longer with us. I mean, I think that's really powerful and an interesting way to put history in front of people who may not be looking for it specifically. Well, I love audio. I mean, one reason why I like podcasts is I love audio. I think there's a richness to isolating the human voice. And so the fact that uh, people are not only sharing their own experiences, they're sharing them in their own words uh, in the way they want to share them, I think is a, is a really powerful thing. And I, I would encourage, I haven't talked about this on the podcast, but I would encourage our listeners to, if you want to begin recording experiences, begin in your family. Uh, mm. Because I, I can tell you, I was speaking to someone today who lost their father recently. Uh, those stories that you think are always going to live around you are not. They're very fragile and, and they're very limited. And so, uh, especially now, we have so many, I mean, there, there's so many things available to us to do great recordings of those stories around us. I would encourage folks to take advantage of that, uh, to make sure those things are in a way we can access them and in a way we can share them. Before I left Tulsa, I was testing out a new camera setup I got. So I decided that I'd interview my grandmother and just ask about some of the stories that she told me in the past and just get it recorded. And I did that and I kind of put it away for several years and didn't really think about it much. And uh, over the years, she's kind of developed problems with her memory and she's Mm. forgotten a lot of the stories that she actually told me. And so having that now, knowing that it's, you know, it's never going to be the same way it was, is invaluable. And that's really led me to do a couple other recordings, including my dad turned 65 and I was like, on your 65th birthday, we're going to sit downstairs for a couple hours and we're just going to talk about stories from your childhood and things you remember growing up so we can have that. And I think there's nothing more powerful than that because even if the quality is terrible, it's something that once that person's gone, it's going to be worth its weight in gold, no matter how it is. Yeah, priceless. I mean, I've, I've done hundreds of oral history interviews, and my favorite interview I ever did was with my father, who's gone now. Thanksgiving before last, I mean, he's been gone for 10 years. Uh, we piled in the car, and I, I loaded up the interview with who, who they knew as Big Daddy and, uh, <laughs> you know, played it for my kids. And and his voice came back to us and those stories came back mm. to us. It really is priceless. Uh, I mean, it, I, I wouldn't give anything in exchange for, for having those recordings. And so I, I think it's great that you had the presence of mind to do that. And I would encourage you to do it with your kids as well, because uh, we all know how that you blink and, uh, and uh, that changes as well. Yeah, that's a good point. I haven't actually interviewed them, but you know, I've got plenty of video of them. I think they're probably the most documented kids on the face <laughs> of the earth. That's a really good idea. I mean, I think a lot of people take for granted the fact that the recorder on your iPhone is pretty dang good and that it's a really good way just to get started. Like you don't have to buy anything fancy. You don't need a fancy mic or a studio. You just take that voice memo thing, hit record and you've started. And I think that's maybe the biggest call to action we can do here for people 
if you've enjoyed this podcast is just start recording your own. You don't know how valuable it's going to be. Yeah. And I would say do what we did. Uh, folks don't know how long some of our recording sessions were. <laughs> <laughs> uh, someone was commenting on how long one was today to me. And I said, you weren't there for the unedited version uh, <laughs> of it. But I, I think spending time, you know, now we think everyone knows who we are and what we're doing because of social media and things like that. But that's not really telling who you are. It's mm. it's not really, you know, an examined life and how do you feel and think about things. Uh, those are the things that take a little time, I think. And so uh, spending time uh, with each other and, and I think it's a great, I think the biggest favor you can do someone is have them tell you their story. Mm. And uh, so spending time to do that, I think is important. The first time I sought to do that, I was a bit intimidated by like, what what do you talk about? You know, what do you say? And so. I'm a big fan of StoryCorps on NPR. Mm -hmm. And so I went to their website and they have lots of different lists of questions that you can look up to ask people, you know, based on different parts of their life or what you're, what you're going for. So if you feel intimidated, like, I don't know what to talk about, just go and look out, you know, look up one of those lists. And I think you'll find a lot of stuff that you can talk about. Yeah. They've tried to get Friday after Thanksgiving designated the national day of listening. Hmm. I guess they're trying to anti Black Friday sort of thing. But but I think listening, man, if there's a skill we need right now is listening to someone mm. else, uh listening to understand to someone else, someone different than ourselves. Mm. And so I think it's a, I think it's a radical act right now to to spend some time listening to someone else. And as my grandfather said, you have two ears and one mouth, so you should use it in that ratio. <laughs> That's good. That's good. <laughs> So do you know what you're going to be doing for JB Hunt? You're going to be doing web development, you said? So I'm joining their web team. I'm not exactly clear exactly what I'll be doing, but it's related to their website. I'll have a better idea once I start. But that's some of my expertise in the past has been in web design and content development and you know creating sales funnels and things like that. So it's going to be kind of related to that. Okay. Interesting. So it'll be your, your duties. I mean, your duties are so broad right now. Yeah. It'll be a little bit more predictable. Uh, yeah. Sort of work you'll be doing right now. I'm kind of a catch all marketing person. Yep. So I do podcasting for my actual work sometimes and video and photography and web design and all that stuff. So it's going to be a lot more focused. And I think that'll be an interesting change of pace because the last two positions I've had have been very general and it's been great for somebody who's a bit ADD like myself. I can always switch and find something new. So it'll be interesting to see how well I do here. You've made some good suggestions in even your story of, you know, say those that are listening that are new of kind of getting to know a place, uh, mm -hmm. exploring the landscape, learning a little bit about the history. Talk a little bit about, say you're roaming around Arkansas here in six months and someone says, hey, tell me about Waco. What are some conclusions or thoughts you might have based on this six-year crash course you've had as a Waco one? I'm always drawn to kind of the historic center, historic downtown of a place. And I'd say that Waco is a place with a deep history, a rich history, but a vibrant future. There's a lot of organizations and entrepreneurs and people trying to do new and innovative things, but it's all kind of through the lens of understanding our history and like the the feel of Waco. I don't know how you, how you put it out there, but it's it's like it's a Texas city, but it's a smaller Texas city. So it doesn't quite have that huge big city feel, but it has all the things that you would ever want to do here in the city. There's, there's music, there's great coffee, great beer, of course, <laughs> but it's not overwhelming. And if you definitely want that, that Texas, that Southern experience, it's got lots of culture around that as well. You've made comparisons to Tulsa uh, at times. That's true. You know, actually the, the history goes back farther with Waco, which is interesting to me. A lot of the history in uh, Tulsa is like Art Deco and, and the oil boom of the 1920s. That's kind of like the main heyday. And so it's interesting to see how people lived and what was important to them back in the day. And of course, you know, Tulsa was about oil and here was about cotton. So it's, it's just a, it's interesting in that they're both, you know, mid-sized cities. Tulsa is quite a bit larger, I'd say, but they're kind of shaped by the river. They go through their core and they have some interesting buildings that are iconic and they have people that are really in touch with their history and their roots. But you were kind of here during a period where a lot was starting or a lot mm -hmm. was initiating. I think we were the, were we the, 
what number of podcasts were we in town? Like two, I think the second one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That was a so, bunch. Yeah. So now you look, there's, there's, I don't know if there's dozens, but there's a, there's a lot of, uh, of podcast here locally. I think I've, I've been in enough cities now, especially smaller Southern and Midwest, Midwest cities that I feel like there is a resurgence where people are saying, you know, we're not going to move out to the suburbs as much. We're going to actually move back into the city center and really respect what we have here, that the structures and the culture and the history, because that tells more of a story than, you know, a strip mall in the suburbs. And so I feel like Tulsa is probably like five years ahead of where Waco is currently, but that's really exciting because Tulsa has also developed a lot. And I see a lot of really interesting development here in Waco. I mean, one of the things I'm really excited about that you'll get to experience, but I, I won't, is the fact that Rogue Media is putting like a, a nice big studio near the escape rooms, which is kind of a cool way to, to put that in downtown and make that accessible to more people. They're going to have an event space. I mean, that's a really cool way to do that. And it's all kind of in the shadow of the courthouse right there in the Alico building. And you can't really do better than that as far as respecting the history and the culture. Yeah. Yeah. It's going to be fun uh, being in that space recording yeah. uh, the podcast. It will. So speaking of moving from the suburbs into the city center, you're kind of making a, a change into East Waco, right? Yeah. So uh, I've lived in Robinson uh, for the last 10 years, but uh, we are uh, breaking ground uh, on a new house uh, in East Waco. And so we will be over on Rusk Street, which is a couple of uh, streets over from uh, Elm Avenue. And uh, we're ecstatic. What you see there is is a uh, walkable, I'm excited about a walkable community, a real diverse community. I can walk to a library. I can walk to a bank now, thanks to TF&B. Uh, I can walk to uh, a coffee shop. I can walk to a restaurant, thanks to Revival. The Bridge Street Extension Project that's going on, that's going to mm-hmm. have a stage and, and Brotherwell nearby. Uh, I can even walk uh, here to Baylor if I want to, or to a game at McLean. So, you, you know, it's amazing to think of a, a walkable city in Texas, but I, I think if you're in the downtown area, there, uh, we still need that grocery store. If you're in the downtown area, it, it really is amazing not only the development that's taken place, but the capacity that, that's still left. I mean, there, there's still a lot of capacity for development in downtown. So you're going to really experience the intersection of history and the urbanization all together there, aren't you? I think so. I think so. We're, we're really, my wife and I are really excited about it. What's the worst thing about Waco? <laughs> put, put Waco on blast. No. Uh, Let's see. The worst thing about Waco. I could think of something. We'll think of something. Yeah. I think the worst thing about Waco is when it gets really unbearably hot. It's not for very long, but you're always close enough to a river. And I was telling my wife that when we first moved here, I was not a fan of the heat, the extreme heat. She was. She doesn't like the cold as much. She's actually not looking forward to going back north again. I tell you what, the heat got a lot more bearable when I started kayaking because when I got too hot, I would just head out to the lake, splash around a little bit, jump in the water, kayak around a little bit. And it was just a much more bearable experience, but it can get pretty dang hot here. Yeah. Yeah. It, it can get brutal. It really can. I, I love that you came up with a creative solution to deal with it though. The kayaking thing really proved to be wonderful for you guys. And I think it's something that people don't think about here as much. I mean, there, there is a, um, a kayaking company, Waco paddle company and the Pura Vida, they do the stand up paddle boards. So you can do it without actually having to invest in actually buying a kayak, but I would highly recommend that people take more advantage of that. I mean, there's times I'm out there and it's so beautiful and I can't believe there's nobody else out there with me. I mean, it's, yeah. it's one of my favorite places to partake of a couple of Brotherwell brews and uh, just to really enjoy magnificent Texas sunset. Speaking of Brotherwell brews, what are your favorite selections at Brotherwell? <laughs> you know, I've talked with the guys about this because they kind of like the lighter and the IPAs and different beers like that. I'm a, I'm a dark beer type of guy. I like stouts and I like porters. Their uh, Percy Porter is one of my favorite porters. They're, they just released um, a barrel-aged version of that in whiskey barrels, and I have not tried that yet, but that is right up my alley. I'm very excited to try that. And, of course, they do. They don't, do they can? They don't can their porter, do they? They don't can the porter. They only mm-hmm. can the wit the Pilsner, like a brown ale type of thing. Yeah. And all the ones they can are delicious. And I love that they can those because they, they pack really well in a cooler for the river because you don't want to be bringing glass to the river. So it's very important to, to remember to bring the cans. And pack out your empties. That's right. 
mm-hmm. leave no trace. <laughs> Steven, it's been really fun doing this with you. I, I honestly didn't even know the first time I met you if you'd actually go for this. I thought he's going to see this crazy guy with no history experience whatsoever saying, let's do a show together. I'm going to take up a bunch of your time and just say, no, I'm too busy for you. So I'm really excited that you didn't turn me away and you had some faith in my vision. It's been delightful. And I, I don't I don't think I can thank you enough, really. I think most folks know neither one of us have been paid a dime uh, right. for anything that we've, for the hours that we've put into this, but it's been such a joy to get to work with you and spend time with you. And we say we're co-creators, but you're the creator. I, I'm the guy that came alongside your idea. And so I really, I really do appreciate it. Personally, I appreciate it. And I also as someone who loves Waco, what a great contribution you made to uh, to this city uh, that's been yours for six years. Well, I really appreciate that. And that's a high honor because without you, nobody would have cared what I thought about Waco because I didn't have any sort of bona fides. But I feel like when I'm, <laughs> when I'm speaking with you, maybe people want to hear a little bit about what I have to say. So it's been a really fun journey and I really hate that it has to end. But, you know, if you guys want to honor my memory in Waco, I think the best thing to do is to keep listening. And I know that you're going to keep doing the podcast. So I'm just really excited to see the shape that the Waco History Podcast takes moving forward. On behalf of everyone listening, thanks, Randy. All right. Cross the Brazos and Waco, ride hard and I'll make it by dawn. Cross the Brazos and Waco. Thanks for listening to the Waco History Podcast. Like what you heard? Subscribe, rate, and review our show on iTunes so we can reach more listeners. You can find show notes and info on every episode at wacohistorypodcast.com and more info on Waco's past at wacohistory.org. Our theme music, used with permission, is Cross the Brazos at Waco, performed by the late Billy Walker. For more info on Billy's music, go to billywalker.com. We'll see you next time. I'm a go, as he dropped the guns that she hated. In the muddy Brazos below Cross the Brazos and Waco Ride hard and I'll make it by dawn Cross the Brazos and Waco I'll walk straight in old San Antonio Then the night came alive with gunfire He knew that at last it'd been found As the ranger's badge showed brightly El Bandito lay on the ground Carmela knew he was dying That all of her dreams were in vain As she kissed his lips for the last time She heard him whisper again Cross the Brazos and Waco Ride hard and I'll make it by dawn Cross the Brazos and Waco I'm safe when I reach San Antonio I'm safe when I 